You may have heard that we're going to be celebrating 175 years of the establishment of this congregation uh, coming up on November 14th. 175 years, that's a long, long time. And uh, the Lord has been faithful. Amen? The Lord has been faithful. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before and been faithful. And we also get to be faithful to pass it on to the next generation. I was thinking about the history of the church, and I was thinking about the history of Milton this past week, and I began to think about a few things, especially about how Milton got its name. Are you familiar with this story? I know many of you are. I'll give you the, the really, really short version of the giving of the name of Milton. The story goes like this. There were people standing around, and they uh, needed to decide on a name uh, for, uh, for the city. And uh, one person said during this meeting that they thought of their former home where they came from as Paradise Lost, but they looked at their new home here as Paradise Regained. And the people of that time, of course, were very familiar with the poet John Milton and his epic poems, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, and thus Milton got its name, named after John Milton and the um, poems, that's the, uh, the poems that he wrote. I was thinking about paradise. John Milton's view of paradise is very different than a biblical view of paradise. I hope you know this. John Milton did not believe that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior. And many people have a view of paradise. It may be that there are beautiful trees because of the fall, and that's paradise. And that's a we understand that. But I was thinking about what is God, what's God's perspective on paradise? How would he define paradise? And that made me to think about the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, I assume, was a lovely place, a paradise. But the reason why it was a paradise is because God was there, not because of its beauty. And so as we understand what does paradise mean from God's perspective, paradise is wherever God is. Heaven is heaven or paradise because God is there. And God's perspective is to not leave heaven in heaven, but bring heaven to earth. And so thus Jesus came saying, the kingdom of God is here. He's essentially saying paradise is coming to earth. Milton or any other place on earth can be paradise when God is there and when God is glorified. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says these words, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. This is the nature of God's advancing kingdom on the earth. God's bringing heaven to earth. And what is the nature of how that happens? God is reconciling the world to himself. Earth is in the process of being reconciled to who God is and to God's original plan and his intent for this world. His plan is to bring people back into his original intent, thus to reconcile the world to himself. Now we've talked over the last several weeks about our primary purpose in the Lord, which is to bring him glory in all that we are, all we do. God is glorified in us when we recognize that he is the source of all things and we are not. God is glorified in us when we recognize that he is the judge of the world and we are not in control of the world or much of anything else for that matter. God is glorified in us when we recognize that he designed life and its rules and we experience life to the full when we obey his rules, when we follow how he's designed, when we live in dependence of who he is. This is how he's glorified. This is the way that he brings heaven to earth. And so becoming like Jesus, we've been talking about becoming like Jesus last week, is spiritual maturity. Becoming like Jesus is to live according to his design, according to how God, God designed us to live, to be reconciled back to his original design. This is becoming like Jesus. When we <clears throat> face problems in our life, they are addressed as we become more like Jesus. Whatever the problem it is, 
that we have, that we are facing, as we become more like Jesus, these problems are all addressed. Then, we live the life that God designed us to live in all of its glory. This is the process of spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is the answer for all the problems you face. Whatever problems they might be, whether they are emotional, whether they are relational, whether they are financial, whether they are whatever, the answer for all of our problems is to grow to become more like Jesus. Now, I want to show you this from Matthew 6.33. As we seek first the kingdom of, of God, as we seek first the kingdom of God, and that means to be reconciled back to how God planned this life to be lived. Then Jesus says, all these things will be added to you as well. All of the answers that we have, all of the answers that we need are to be found in seeking first the kingdom of God. It's really that simple, but there are many ways that God leads us. And so it can be very complex in some ways, but ultimately it's very simple. As we seek to be reconciled to God's will for our lives, he answers our problems. Now, how does this spiritual growth happen? If growing to become more like Jesus, or growing in spiritual maturity is the answer for the problems that we face, then how does this happen? Last week, I shared with you Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works in you both to will or to want and to work for his good pleasure. And so how does God work in us? What is the nature of how he works in us in order to want to do what he wants us to do? What are his methods? It's important for us to understand what they are. There's a very simple answer to this. His answer is in relationships. How does God grow us to become more like Jesus? The answer is relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationships with God's people. This is the method that God uses to grow us to be more like him. The closer the relationship, the greater the potential for change. The closer the relation, you might want to write that down. The closer the relationship, the greater the potential for change. Now, the early followers of Christ were called Christians. Who knows why they were called Christians? Because they were like Jesus. Christian means little Christ. You've heard this before. Little Christ. They were many Jesuses. Does anybody have a child that they call mini me because they act like you? Or somebody in your family? Mini me. This is, we're mini Jesuses. If we're like Christ. Okay? In the book of Acts, the Jewish leaders brought the early disciples on trial. And one of the things that they said about these first disciples, these apostles, is they said they recognized that these guys had been with Jesus because they acted like him. They were bold like Jesus. Jesus boldly stood up to the, the leaders of his time and said, you guys are not doing things God's way. And that's exactly what the disciples did too. They said, we don't care what you say, we care what God says. And what did these leaders say? They said, wow, these guys are like Jesus. Why were they like Jesus? Because they spent time with Jesus. They acted like Jesus because they spent time with Jesus and they became like Jesus. This is why they were changed. And so God's plan for us to become like Jesus is relationships. Relationships with God and with other people. Now specifically, I wanted to talk about our relationship with God with his spirit of truth and grace. A relationship with God is a relationship with the spirit of truth and grace. And he works in us for change through this spirit. John chapter 117 says this, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
When Jesus came and walked on earth, grace and truth, the spirit of grace and truth was realized in his life. Now last week I said that Jesus fully embraced his father's will and that if we were going to grow to be like him, we needed to do the same thing. And that means that we need to embrace the truth. To be like Jesus in character, in our thoughts, and our actions, and all that we are, we have to embrace the truth. He is truth. But Jesus, when he lived on this earth and he came 2,000 years ago, that wasn't the beginning of God's truth on the earth. God shared his truth throughout history. Thousands of years before Jesus came on the scene, God was in the world sharing his truth through his servants, his messengers, the prophets. Now, most of these messengers uh, were, all of the messengers were Jewish. And most of their messages were to the Jewish people, but sometimes they were to the rest of the world. However, there was a problem. Most of the time, these messengers were not received very well. Most of, these, most of the time, God's messages of truth were rejected. And we see that even when Jesus walked on this earth, his message of truth was rejected by a large number of people. And so there's a problem with becoming like Jesus that has been going on for the entire history. Because if you don't accept and receive the truth, then you cannot be changed to become like Christ. The Apostle Paul describes the reception of God's truth this way in uh, Romans chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 he says it very personally I was once alive apart from the law but when the commandment came sin came alive and I died the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me there was a deception that came what was this deadly deception it's the same deception I talked about last week with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. See, what happened was when we are presented with the law, we are presented with a commandment, we are presented with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we cannot handle the truth. Because the truth creates in us a deception. The, cr- the truth creates in us a deception, and that deception is simply this. In myself, I can obey God's laws. This is a lie. In myself, I have nothing good. That's what the Bible says. I cannot follow God's commands. And yet when Adam and Eve, they took the bite of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they began to buy into the same deception that we've received as well. And this deception is is that in our own self, we have the power to obey God's commands. This is the root of humanism. Humanism essentially essentially says that in myself, I can understand the difference between right and wrong, and I can do what is right. But I want to be clear, this is not what the Bible says. In fact, the evil one knows the Bible better than we do, because he understands this very clearly, that the very commandment that was intended to do good for us actually created us deception that caused us to die to God. And so believing in us that we have the power to do good apart from God's is the path of sin. Here's the truth. We were not designed to live by the law. Did you know that? God did not design us to live by laws. He designed us to live in complete dependence on him, doing whatever he says innocently. Yes, God. We were not designed in ourselves to be able to judge between right or wrong. That is not how God created us. And so God is reconciling his people back to the simple devotion to Christ. Understand that what God says is true. Bottom line. We don't have to evaluate whether God says it's true or not. It just is. When God says it, it's true. And yet in our own minds, When the word of God is preached to us, we actually have the audacity to to question whether or not it's true. This is the huge deception that we live in when we were not designed for this in the first place. So Adam and Eve lost their innocence when they gained for themselves and they gained for us this knowledge of, of good and evil. 
Therefore, it's impossible for us to keep God's laws. We needed something else. Actually, someone else is what we needed. We needed grace. And Jesus came with grace. He came upholding the truth, but he didn't just come truth. He came with grace. The unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God Almighty. This is what Jesus brought with him, and this is what Jesus is planting all over the world. This understanding that God loves us, and there's nothing we can do to make him more pleased with us than we already are. The only way that we can be pleasing to God is through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is it. There's nothing that we can do that will merit his favor whatsoever. It's only through Christ. Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 3 says this. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sinful offering, a sin offering. The law is truth and truth by itself can never cause us to be more like Jesus because of the weakness that we have for sin. Now here's how the spirit of the law works. God is good. You're bad. Stop it. Very simple to understand. How many times has knowing what is right and wrong kept you from doing what's wrong? How many times has that worked? It doesn't really work. The Bible says it doesn't work. Your own experience says it doesn't work. So why do we continue to try to live in the thing that doesn't work? We need to live, we need to be reconciled back to what God's design is in order to live lives that are honoring and holy to him. And so God's commands are necessary in our lives because they reveal how sinful we are. They show us how totally apart from God we are and we need that understanding. But understanding that does not help us to live according to these commands, according to the law. It doesn't help us. We can't pray enough. We can't memorize enough scripture. We can't do enough good things for people all over the world to gain God's favor. God just loves us the way we are and wants us to be how he's made us. Nothing more and nothing less. And this is to live in the reality of his grace. Listen to what Romans 8 verses 1 and 2 says about his grace. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is what does it for us, folks. It's not the law of sin and death. Because God's grace does not condemn us, we are free to live as God intended. Now, this same reality is true for everyone on planet Earth. The reality that we all are under sin The difference for those of us who understand God's grace and are learning to live under God's grace is that we recognize that there's nothing in us that can live according to God's commands. That we need help. That we can't do it without Jesus. That we are completely, fully dependent on Him to do anything that is good. And so we must repent of the nature of sin that lies within us continually that thinks that we can live up to God's expectations and instead turn away from that deception and turn towards Christ Jesus fully dependent on his working through our lives to be pleasing to him. We were created this way. We were created to live under God's grace. Now here's what the Bible says about God's grace. We read this together before from Titus chapter 2. It says, The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Did you catch that? It is the grace of God that teaches us to say no. It is not the law of God that teaches us to say no. It is not knowing what is right and wrong that teaches us to say no. It is understanding God's grace that does it. How do we know God's grace? How can we live in this grace? It's only through Christ. And uh, I love what Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9 says. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, that anyone should boast. 
So folks, we need the truth, but we also need God's grace. We need his unmerited and unearned favor. This grace leads us into a relationship with Christ. From the beginning of our relationship with Christ, we then begin to learn how to live according to this grace and to distance ourselves from the spirit of the law. The spirit of truth and grace helps us in our weakness. It guides us into truth through his grace. Now, the Spirit of God has many ways that he does this, but one of the ways that is most important on how he guides us is he guides us through his people, the body of Christ, the, the Lord who is working in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. He uses other Christ followers in our lives to help us in this. It's his method. He doesn't just do it without anybody else. He does it through his people. Now, the Bible uses an example of the body. The body of Christ is called a body to show how these relationships work. In the same way that each part of the body is connected to the brain by the nervous system and responds to the commands that are given through it, each part of the body of Christ is connected to the head of the body, which is Jesus, and responds to the commands given to it. But if you're connected to the body, then you can receive the commands. If you're not connected to the body, you can't. So if you're connected to Christ, you're automatically connected to his body. And how, does these, how do these connections work to help us to grow to become more like Jesus? Let me lay it out for you. In Ephesians chapter 4, we've used these verses before. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow in every respect, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. We talked about this. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. How does God work through his people? As we are connected to the Lord through our relationship with him, we then have relationship with his people. And as each part of this body, as each one of us becomes like God intended, then we begin to build each other up. And so as I work towards living like Christ, and as I am encouraged by him and by you, then I reconcile to how God wants me to live, and then you are impacted, and you impact other people. And so God works through his people to help grow us up together as each part of the body becomes like Christ. This is how God works. This is his plan. He doesn't work outside of his body to do this. In order to grow, we must be connected to his body. It is how he has designed us to operate and is how he has designed us to live. God said it is not good that man should be, live alone. And why did he say that? Not just for the marriage relationship. It's for the body of Christ who is a reflection of God's marriage relationship, by the way. We need each other. We need relationships built on trust so that we can depend on each other to speak the truth and love to each other. We need the reflection of God's relationship in other people to help build us up to become more like him. If we have this relationship, these relationships in the context of truth and grace that Jesus is showing to us and reflecting to us, then we can change and become more like him. Now the problem with drive through church is it doesn't provide the opportunity for relationships of trust to develop. The problem with simply having connection with the body in worship on Sabbath morning is that it is not enough of an opportunity to develop relationships of trust that we can begin to speak the truth in love to each other and allow God in his spirit to grow us up to become more like Jesus. It's simply not enough. And so we must not only have relationships that are on the surface level, we must develop relationships of trust within the body of Christ that can go on to a deeper level and can begin to address interior issues 
so that Christ can be glorified. This is how he works in us. It is not simply listening to messages and worshiping God together in a corporate body. We must become the body of Christ to each other and develop these kind of relationships if we want to grow to become more like Jesus. This is how he designed us to be. And you know what? It is exciting to be a part of God's work in us becoming more and more like Christ. We can be close to each other in geography and not have any impact on each other to grow to become more like Jesus. How many of you have neighbors that you never talk to? How many of you have people that you see day in and day out and yet there's no exchange of life together? But God has designed us to be people that exchange life, exchange truth in the context of grace with one another in order that we become more and more like Jesus. Now, that's the first aspect of how we impact each other as followers of Christ in our relationships of trust together. There's a second ingredient that I think is very important as well, and that ingredient is humility. Humility. Humility is key to God's work in us through others. It does no good for us if we have those that we lean on for support and encouragement in the body of Christ if we lack humility. Now listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are poor in spirit recognize their need for God. They are humble and they recognize that God works not only through his spirit, but he works through other people who are followers of Christ to be able to speak into our lives so that we can become more and more like Christ. It comes as we humbly recognize our need for God and for God's people. He made us to be dependent on him, but he also made us to be dependent or interdependent on each other. And in order to be interdependent on each other, we need humility. We need to say, I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm dependent dependent on my brothers and sisters in Christ to help me to grow. Did you know that you need other people in order to grow to be more like Jesus? You can't do it on your own. It is impossible. It is a spiritual law that you cannot do this on your own. There's lots of things that you can learn on your own, but you cannot substitute somebody else speaking the truth and grace in your life. So let us stop being people who think that we can grow to become more like Jesus on our own. We need each other. We need relationships of trust that can be built upon each other. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we need to be those that have relationships of trust for everyone in the world. That's not how God designed us. He designed us to develop close relationships with other people that are, are growing so that we can share things with each other and build each other up in the context of a larger body of Christ that we have other relationships with. Our church is one segment of the body of Christ all over the world. There are millions and millions and millions of Christ followers who you will never meet. And God did not design you to have close relationships with someone you don't know. But he has designed you to have close relationships with people that you do know. We are not called to be responsible for growing each other in Christ. We are called to be responsible to follow the Lord and what he has commanded us to do. We are commanded to love one another, to bear one another's burdens, to pray for one another, to speak the truth and love to another, one another, and any other one another that is involved in Scripture. This is our responsibility. We are not called to grow another person in Christ. That's the domain of God. That's the domain of God alone. But we are all called to be who he has created us to be. And in that is to develop relationships of trust. As each one of us learns to do this and depend on the Lord, and secondly, to depend on his people, the body of Christ, we will grow to become more like Jesus. It's just, it's just what happens. It's his plan. It's how he does it. And so I want to challenge you this morning to consider that the Lord may have a plan for you to further develop relationships of trust with your brothers and sisters in Christ that you haven't walked into yet. If you don't have those relationships 
with brother, your brothers and sisters in Christ that you can depend on for support. When you're in the midst of temptation and you need somebody to just reach out to you and say, hey, pray for me, I'm being tempted. Or when you're in the midst of a struggle and you need somebody else to reach out to. If you haven't developed those relationships of trust, let me encourage you this morning that the Lord wants you to do that. Take the time to reflect and to pray and say, Lord, how do you want me to grow in these relationships? And so God, as he does us, as he works in us to do that, he will grow the whole body together as we are reconciled to his plan for us. So to that end, let's just pray and lift it up before the Lord this morning. Father, I thank you that you are, you were in the world reconciling uh, us to Christ. And your plan to do that is not only through your spirit of truth and grace, but also through us and through our relationships with each other. As we reflect Jesus, Lord, we're able to help impact our brothers and sisters to grow more like you. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would work in us, that you would lead us on, Lord, to develop these relationships if they're not there. Father, that you encourage us in the relationships that we do have, Father. Father, that you help us in all of these ways. And Lord, I just pray um, this morning uh, in, in closing for anyone, Father, that has a need and that has been asking you, Lord, for help. Um, uh, there's questions, there's wisdom that's needed. Father, I pray even right now that you would bring uh, your word to bear. Lord, I pray for provision. Lord, I thank you that you're God that provides for our needs. Lord, I, I pray for even an increase in faith and trust, Lord. Father, I pray that, that you would uh, remind us, Lord, how much you love us. Lord, that you are for us and not against us. God, that, that, that you have everything in heaven and earth, Lord, um, uh, at our disposal. You've given us everything we need for life and for godliness in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, um, I, I pray for those, Lord, who are in need or asking these questions. Father, hear and answer. We pray this in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Amen.